Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Rabbi Joshua Stanton is the spiritual co-leader of East End Temple in New York and senior fellow of CLAL, the National Center of Learning and Leadership. Together with Rabbi Benjamin Spratt, he writes a column for Religion News Service. Rabbi Benjamin Spratt is senior rabbi of Congregation Road of Shalom in New York City and the co-founder of Sherenu for Jewish families with special needs. Together, they have co-authored this new book, which we're going to talk about today, Awakenings. Welcome to Josh and to Ben. It's great to have you here. And to have two rabbis who work together so seamlessly, that by itself is a Jewish miracle. <laughs> Let's start with you, Josh, and thank you for letting me call you by your first names. How did this book come to be? What was the gestation and the original idea? In the dark days of April 2020, um, a dear friend, Ben Spratt, connected with me and started asking really big questions. What's going on in the Jewish world? What will be of our congregations? What will be of wider society? And we'd been working together and studying together for a decade and decided that a book could be a really wonderful way to explore this. Now, when you say he was asking you these big questions, was this just over coffee, over email? Like it's, in in April 2020, <laughs> definitely over I, Zoom. That's true. Everybody, everybody was kind of thinking about big questions, but it's not necessarily what you're talking about with your fellow clergy. What, like, how come that was kind of your way of communicating? We're so fortunate. We have a relationship of vulnerability and openness. And I think, truth be told, I was in a dark place during the pandemic and reached out to a beloved clergy friend um, just to see what was going on and if I could get some more perspective. I felt like I had the rat's eye view of the pandemic. I was doing funeral after funeral on Zoom, often in my bedroom, and I needed to Zoom out. And who would I want to Zoom out with? Certainly no one other than Rabbi Ben Spratt. And so when he connected, a lot of big questions came up. And so you started, did you actually start writing right away? or? That so we brought in David Berman, who is the publisher of Berman House, and he and I had been in conversation for some time, and I had been providing unsatisfactory ideas for books. And I said, you know, that might be a recurrent theme, but I know someone who can help us, and that's Rabbi Ben Spratt. And so we brought together different strands of conversation, and Ben brought his usual erudition and perspective, and David immediately saw the potential for a book that we could do together. And this book is called Awakenings. What's the subtitle? Uh, this is called Transformations uh, of American Judaism in Identity, Leadership, and Belonging. I, I almost caught you. No, almost. I, almost caught you. <laughs> I got it. So. <laughs> I know we, we went back and forth on it. So. Um, and so what, what's the elevator pitch if, you, if you're going to tell someone what the book is about before you explain the title? So in essence, we inherited a narrative of American Judaism that is ever in decline, ever on the brink of being extinguished. And some of what we have learned is that as we look at Jewish history, often the most exciting narratives have always come with a bloom from the margins. And we decided to bring some curiosity. Um, we started to sit down together, and one of the things that I love about Rabbi Josh Stanton is whatever is the simple narrative placed in front of him, he always wants to kind of pull back and look at, well, what's the larger, more complex background behind it? And so we started to look at American history first, starting to see that actually there have been many ebbs and flows, many moments of ascension of American religion and the way in which it's been dissipated. And so we decided to actually look and see, are there patterns that we could find in that? And what ended up coming is that actually at the precipice of awakenings in American history have always come this moment where the center, the structures of power, the organizations find themselves in decline and strong new voices come from the margins because their needs haven't been met. And what inevitably comes is then they start to gather together and in this new restructured power, what comes is new organizations and the chance to see a bright dawning of a new age. And so then we started to look at Jewish history and seeing that this has happened again and again and again for thousands of years. And what comes with it is a chance to take a time of transformation that has great many pains and fears associated with it and start to see what are the other narratives, what are the other layers of this that might bring some optim optimism and hope and excitement. And so awakenings is the idea that we're, we're about to have one or we're in one, am I right? That we are in the midst of transformations that we believe are unfolding into an American Jewish awakening. But it's, it's funny, and maybe it's not so funny because it's obvious, Jews tend to just look at everything that's going wrong. <laughs> and, and you're saying that in a way this has been the arc of history of the hand-wringing of there's fewer of us, 
fewer are joining synagogues, my kids aren't marrying Jews, all of these anxieties have come through history in different iterations, obviously, but that sometimes what's missed is that there's been innovation and rebirth, even in, in the hand-wringing. In a way, the hand-wringers have missed that an awakening is happening. Is that, am I getting that right? We have a lot of inherited trauma. If we were to look at my family tree, there would be more dead branches than living branches. And at the same time, if I'm only looking backwards, it's very difficult to see what's unfolding. And the data speaks for itself. 30 years ago, when we began, we began anticipating an assimilatory death spiral for American Judaism, born of intermarriage, born of other trends that really scared the demographers, our population has grown by about two million people since then. And before you say like what's turned, I just want to, you, you cite the 1991 study um, and the literary critic and writer who said, Leslie Fiedler said, it was a silent holocaust in, the 19, in 1991. He, he was talking about assimilation and intermarriage? Yes, he was talking about his children, he was talking about himself, and he couldn't imagine a reality in which people married to folks who are not Jewish would have Jewish families. He could not imagine the excitement of people joining Judaism. He could not imagine a future in which people loved Judaism so much that even if they did not convert per se, they would engage with Judaism as a wisdom tradition. And so what has happened since then, it's not been the Leslie Fiedler situation, it's been the Rabbi Yitz Greenberg situation. In 1987, Rabbi Greenberg came out with an incredible series of essays about a third era in Jewish life. And he said the institutions that we have, they were about fighting oppression. They were about making our way in the United States. What comes next? It's about lay people, it's about thriving, it's about self-actualization. And so we are building upon Rabbi Greenberg's theories from 1987 because they have held true when so many of the theories of the pessimists have fallen by the wayside and been countered by an abundance of data. But ben, you write, the comfort of this well-worn story anchors us to past generations angst. We feel the inevitability of failure even when much is going well. And I love this, we are still just a fiddler on the roof destined to come crashing down at some point. What is the investment in the pessimism, do you think? Why are we holding on to it? And I, and I mean, I'm joking about, you know, uh, the lacrimose kind of frame of Judaism, but what, why is it that we're, isn't it also that we're, there is fear based on reality? Absolutely, and I think some of what we're looking at is to see that if you, you go to the essence of the Jewish psyche, survivalism is at its core. I mean, look at the, the ebbs, the tides that have constantly crashed against Judaism, the moments that we have stood at the brink again and again and again, and so there's a very good reason to fear. As has been reported over and over again, as we see rising anti-Semitism going on in this country. But that's not the only story. And so what we're looking to do is not to say to everyone, everything is okay, but let's lift up the story that nobody's talking about right now. Let's lift up the story that for over 16 years now, Jews have been the most well-liked religious group in America, alongside the, the rising anti-Semitism. What if we were to go back and look at the boom of synagogues in the 1950s and see that that was coming out of the trauma of the Holocaust, the sense of vulnerability, and what did we want to do? We wanted to create a permanent fixture to say that our establishments, our temples, our synagogues, we are here and we are proud and the world cannot ignore us nor move us into the shadows. But as we look at synagogue attendance from the 1950s to today, it's no different. So while we get to see this incredible building project, the project was not to say that these centers were actually bringing more people into prayer and community, but rather to say that the need at that time was creating a sense of felt permanency, establishment. Now we're at a place where the American Jewish population is growing at a faster pace than the American population. And so not only is it- Say that again. The American Jewish population is growing at a faster pace wow. than the American population. We are doing what feels almost impossible, and that's because we rested on the shoulders of past generations that felt the urgency of survival to build and to gather people together. And as needs have evolved, as maybe people have felt less vulnerability and a need to sit behind strongholds, there's come new challenges. And now the opportunity is how do we meet these new needs just as prior generations met the needs of their time. And Josh, what would you say some of the new needs are? Certainly belonging, but in many different ways. Belonging can mean belonging online. Belonging can mean 
Belonging in a relationship with a spiritual leader who might not be ordained. Belonging can mean so many different things. Another is learning. We are living through a time of remarkable change. It is almost unprecedented change, and I say almost because our tradition has been around since before the Bronze Age. So we have a wisdom tradition from which to draw that can inform us in this time of change, guide us and strengthen our step. So I would say learning, belonging, and then envisioning what self-actualization could be. We're in a time where we, in which we are all chasing the chimera of perfection, of what we see in social media, of what people post about, of what people share with each other even over the water cooler. And our tradition grounds us in a different way. It gives us the possibility of looking at the dark spots of ourselves, the challenging spots in our life, and then taking steps towards greater fulfillment and greater possibility. You didn't so, mention the word spirituality, unless I missed it. Was that, is that one of the new needs, or is that, I mean, it's not so new, but are you seeing that, again, as a shift in terms of what Jews might be looking for? I think that we are re-engaging spiritually. If, uh, if history is indeed a guide, the generations after the Holocaust, for good reason, struggled with questions of a higher power. The question in front of everyone was, where was God at Auschwitz? And that was a totally reasonable and appropriate question to ask. And now we've had some distance, and that is both incredibly painful and difficult. And for many people in younger generations, it opens broader questions. Could God exist everywhere but not be in direct relationship with the individual? How does God operate in the world? How do I operate? What is the significance of my life? And so I think with time, there's been a broadening of questions that people are willing to ask and entertain. And so the spiritual search has been revivified for the first time since the Holocaust. Yeah, ben, you, you say we, that you're calling into question the dichotomy of legacy and startup. Explain yes. that. So one of the narratives that we've sat in for a while um, is we happen to both be connected to more established synagogues. Um, I'm in a synagogue that is celebrating 180 years. East End is just a little bit uh, newer than that, but still. Uh, How going old back. is East End? 75. Wow. So we're a baby. Yeah. <laughs> and what's often seen is these new young startups um, are, have no idea what it really takes to build community. And inevitably, what they will simply become is another synagogue. And in return, many of our colleagues that have courageously stepped out into the margins to meet the needs of those who are not being met by Rota Shalom or by East End Temple are finding themselves actually um, invigorated because they're able to immediately create something without some of the albatross, uh, I guess, of a legacy, of a sense of this is our identity, this is what we do. And what we're imagining actually is, just as we've seen in other industries, the most dynamic relationship might be how do we draw on the wisdom of experience, of seeing generations evolve and change over time, while also having effectively an R&D department. How do we make sure that we're constantly listening to the needs of not just that are already within our community, but meeting those needs also with the sense of What's the resource that's required? What are the structures actually that enable efficiency? Rota Shalom started as a 20-person Orthodox synagogue on the Lower East Side, mm -hmm. became a conservative synagogue on the Upper East Side, and then moved over to become a reformed synagogue wow. on the West Side, but never broke apart. And that, to me, is significant because it's showing prior generations recentering again and again on the needs of the people and manifesting the organization to meet those needs. What we're proposing is simply doing the same thing with intention. So as we look out into these very exciting, very courageous startups to say, what if we could give you some of the resource? What if we could learn from you and you could feel actually connected so that as people mature and they need other structures, we're ready to hold them. And as we find that people are in our community and moving to the margins, that you're right there to hold them. And what if we created this reciprocal relationship of constant learning and, and a, a dynamic sense of belonging? But very practically, you know there, the other Jewish anxiety among many is, I want to hear the songs I grew up with. I want to sit in as long a service as I, my parents and my grandparents sat in. Some people, at least in my synagogue, want to sit in the seats of their, of their ancestors. There, a lot of Judaism is what we know and what we remember. Yes. And what I'm getting from your book is you're also really lifting up. The change is also in our DNA, and we forget that. And it's also, it is the future. It doesn't mean you're tossing everything out. 
but you're not being afraid of what is actually like adaptable, adapting new, and, and frankly speaking to people maybe more powerfully than the old ways. But just you're, how are you balancing those who, are, who feel anxious about what you might be letting go? I think there's real reason to feel anxious. Change is hard. We as people are wired to desire comfort, to feel the sense that our own belonging is measured in our familiarity. When we walk in and we hear melodies or we see people that we don't understand, it doesn't give the sense of this is my place. So it's important to name that. But the problem is, is that if we only let our sense of belonging be defined by nostalgia, by our own personal comfort, then anyone who doesn't have that already we're simply saying you don't belong here. And we can't just say, by the way, we're inclusive. Pull a chair up to the table. The only way to actually create a sense of belonging is not just throwing another chair at the table, but say we actually might need to reset the table. We might need to change the menu a little bit here. And we've done this before. And it's the fact that we forget that, that we have a little amnesia when it comes to nostalgia. The melody of Avinu Malkenu that rings through almost every synagogue it's around this country. It's from Sinai. <laughs> it's less than 100 years old. Yeah. And it was very controversial when it first came out. And we forget that. And so some of this is how do we hold a little bit of compassion for the fact that it is scary mm -hmm. to deal with change, but also draw courage knowing that we have always done that in Judaism. Ben just talked about the people you don't recognize when you walk into synagogue. And I, I know you don't mean to be vague, but I want to be a little more concrete about that. You're walking in, you're seeing people of color. We're talking about LGBTQ community that often hasn't also felt seen and included. People with disabilities. There's ways in which I think that the Jewish community says or wants to be inclusive. But then, as you said, they haven't really reset the table. They just say, pull up a chair. You're addressing that head on in your book, and you're obviously to people who are not of color. How did you kind of approach these sensitivities, particularly now um, in the post sort of George Floyd reckoning, where I think every institution has had to do soul searching? So I would begin by saying, I am mediocre but trying. And I think that is true of many people who look like us and sound like us. And this is not an ode to straight, cis, white men in pulpit rabbinets, but it is to say that I think there are more good intentions than we sometimes realize. There's an ethos that's been lost in recent years, and that is noblesse oblige, that those who have privilege, those who have a place of power, those who have a voice need to use it for good, and especially in support of those who are unheard, unseen, or worse than that, shunned. And so that's the place that this comes from. We acknowledge at the outset that we're not going to do this in every way right. We inherently have limited perspective. We inherently have a limited field of view. And at the same time, it's an invitation to be joined by many others who would like to step up, maybe step away from the table for a moment, and see how others would reset it if only they would be given the opportunity. And that's really our goal. There's a quote again from the book, our people can no longer be defined by genetics as much as by continual self-improvement through intentional practice, community support, and a belief in our higher purpose. So first I want to take the first part of it. Our people can no longer be our people Jews, I assume. Yes. Can no longer be identified by genetics. Is that kind of where we've been, you think, entirely? I think more than we would like to be. I love to quote Rabbi Brad Hirschfield, who describes in some of the earliest synagogues um, in ancient Assyria um, and in the northern part of Israel, there were pews that were endowed by Jews and pews that were endowed by Gentiles. And what that implies is that many different people were finding meaning in the synagogue. It might not have been a house of prayer, it might have been more of a house of gathering, but it was a Jewish gathering space, maybe the JCC of the day. And if that was true a couple of thousand years ago, why are we so afraid of that possibility today? Why can't we open the possibility that our tradition is unique, that there is a peoplehood aspect to who we are and what we're about, but that it's far broader than that, and that universal practices can have meaning to countless other people. And it's almost as though we're shutting the door before we see who's at the door. And it would be really wonderful if we opened the door, took a deep breath, maybe address some of our own lingering insecurities openly, and then try to listen with care. Why can't we lead with hospitality? 
Ben, there, it's widely known that every seminary rabbinical school is uh, down in numbers, applicants, graduates. And we're not going to unpack why that's happening right now exactly, but I'd love you to just, you address it. And, and it is interesting as to the fact that you lift up lay leadership as another path. It's not necessarily in response to what I just described in terms of ser seminary enrollment, but can you talk about what you, what you are envisioning there? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that both Josh and I get to enjoy is we have a profession that is dependent on people needing us. We get to have contracts at wonderful organizations because we are seen as essential to Jewish life. And the great irony is that the creation of the rabbi, the cantor, as um, really an ecclesiastic figure is something that we've seen as a pendulum swing throughout Judaism. And what's ironic is that... So what do you mean ecclesiastic figure? Meaning a person that is almost an intermediary between the people and God, serving effectively a very priestly role. Many people in my community it, believe that they can't really have an authentic religious experience without having me or a cantor in the room. And that is fabulous for my job secu security, but it actually goes maybe counter to one of the most important elements of Judaism, which is this notion that post-temple, post-destruction of the temple, God is accessible to anyone. And actually we have a tradition that is, has a, a great anti-authoritarian streak and this notion of how do we take wisdom and say that wisdom is accessible to anyone willing to come to the well. And so part of what Josh and I are looking at is some of the hindrances of Amer the American Jewish organized world are the limitations of how do we maintain professions like ours. Large salaries, large buildings that aren't being used very efficiently. And what would happen if we actually looked it to the wisdom of prior generations that because of a place of urgency, lay leadership had to step forward. We see some of the most exciting stuff going on in America today is not happening in urban centers, but is happening in actually rural America because they can't afford clergy. And so they're forced to step forward. And empowerment is one of the most powerful ways for people to feel a sense of ownership and to say, this is vital to my life. It's a toolkit that helps me see I can create sacred moments. I can actually gather people together. I can be a community leader and not necessarily have to spend money in order to do so. We are looking at this as one of the bright lights of what's coming. And if they don't know Torah, and they don't know Talmud, and they don't know Hebrew. Well, if I may go meta for a moment, this conversation is case in point about why lay leadership is so important. Um, you are a lay leader extraordinaire in many different Thank capacities. You. But speaking forthrightly, is this conversation more meaningful than the conversation spurred on by 95% of the sermons that I give? Absolutely. Why? because you're asking better questions than I'm asking. You understand the perspectives that need to be addressed. Thank you. And that is, you're obviously an exceptional lay leader, and then there are incredible lay leaders out there as well who are looking at the Jewish world in a different way and who are accessing the wisdom as never before. Safaria.org, um, I was having a conversation with a, a rabbinic colleague, and we both came to the conclusion that that is probably the single most important platform or website in Jewish life, bar none. It does not have hundreds of millions of dollars behind it. What it is, it's a platform where people can go and share of their reflections on text, translate text, and be in dialogue with each other and rabbis for thousands of years. How incredible is that? No one's checking to see if you're a clergy person. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars on and a CD you, of Bar Ilan. And if you could just explain that, that what is accessible on Safaria for those so, who don't so, know. Oh, incredible. My, my apologies for cutting you off. Safaria, um, evidently I'm excited about it. It has <laughs> it translated the Talmud. It has translated so much of Midrash. It has translated the Hebrew Bible. It has translated just a remarkable number of rabbinic texts. Um, clergy across the country go there when they're looking for interesting translations and commentaries. And it has all of a sudden become a platform not just for clergy, but for anyone seeking to engage Jewishly. Now we don't have data to back this, but I would love for Safaria to conduct some research into who is using their platform. I would bet you a lot of people who are not Jewish are reveling in it. I bet you a lot of people who are starting to explore Judaism are reveling in it. I know that many of the students in my Intro to Judaism class look to it every single week to study Torah because it's more accessible, no one's judging them, they can read it in their pajamas, and they have access to the greatest wisdom 
of our tradition from thousands of years. You write, a return to the era of the early rabbis may be afoot, in which we all learn and teach, pray and gather, lead and reimagine. The distinctions between lay leader and clergy, institution and network are already beginning to blur. And you've both echoed that. I just wonder about where some might be unsettled by the idea that you're doing them out of a job. And suddenly these structures that people are invested in professionally, financially, are going to be questioned, dismantled, everything's up in the air. So again, we're trying to describe what is taking place, um, not necessarily to proscribe uh, what is coming. And some of why we're doing this is because if we look around, we are seeing that more and more synagogues are closing. There are fewer and fewer clergy jobs in the way that we typically define them. But what we're also seeing is there's a rise of many new ways to rabbi, to be clergy in American Judaism. You know, we were very inspired. One of our colleagues, Rabbi Rachel Isaacs, uh, is head, one of the co-founders and heads of the Center for Small Town Jewish Life up in Maine. In addition, she's on faculty at Colby, and she also is a pulpit rabbi and has created this very interesting dynamic rabbi, rabbinet that is actually multifaceted. It is looking at how to be an educator, it's looking at how to be a community organizer, and how to be a spiritual leader. Now, when you bundle all those together, that looks and sounds a lot like a rabbi. At least, what's, uh, at least at the surface of what most people think of as being an American rabbi. But when you get into it, you get to see, wow, so she's created a relationship with a university, she's created a connection with a synagogue community, and she's become an entrepreneur showing new ways of knitting people together. For us, we draw an inspiration of that. We look back at the Talmudic rabbis that were carpenters and beer brewers and peddlers and wondering how did the other parts of their profession actually inspire their wisdom? And how did coming together with those different skill sets actually create something much more dynamic than ever could have happened if they would simply lockstep having the same job descriptions? One of the things that struck me in this, it's really a wonderful book and it, it kind of bends your mind in a way that I think makes you energized about the future, even with my own anxiety, um, is this the, the number of, I don't know if you want to call them the innovations that are already here, that we've already seen, that have actually been contagious. Um, I just want to name some, and if you maybe each of you would pick up one to describe, um, Ritual Well, Moisha House, um, Amichai Laulavi's Lab Shul, Joey Weisenberg, Rising Song Institute, Maim, Immerse NYC, IJS, the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, the Musar Institute, Haggadot.com, where anybody can make their own Haggadah. I mean, this is just a, a literally a snapshot of a huge list. Sometimes we, we don't stop and notice this is already happening. Um, can each of you maybe pick one to kind of say what you want to? You know, I thought um, your conversation with Dr. Judith Rosenbaum was uh, incredible. Um, she said, I'm the executive director of the Jewish Women's Archive. And when I started, that was fairly straightforward. Now, what is it to be Jewish? What is it to be a woman? And what is it to be an archive? And so not only is she disrupting in a place where archives are seen as sort of something at the back of libraries rather than Dusty living. Dusty and stayed. Yeah, rather than the source of empowerment for people to get incredible ideas, to spur them to lead in their own communities, to, to galvanize action. But she is questioning the underlying premises of all three, not as some intellectual exercise, but as a way of advancing the Jewish community itself. What an incredible gift. She's doing it all online, and the Jewish Women's Archive has always been online. Mm -hmm. What an innovator. Great. Amazing. Ben. One of the organizations that I think Josh and I have been very inspired by um, is, uh, is Hadar, uh, which has had many different iterations and aspects and started as an independent minion, is a yeshiva. It also now includes Rising Song. And what's interesting is that it really, uh, we had a chance to speak to Rabbi Eli Confer, who helped found Hadar. And he really sees that the Jewish technologies of learning actually are maybe one of the things that are most needed and necessary today. This notion of chavruta, of learning and fellowship. This notion that debate machloket is actually one of the only ways to truth in the world. And what would it be if we could look at the incredible division of America today and say, actually, Judaism has the right technology, the right toolkit to help the country, to help give us a vocabulary to see how can we have a relationship across divides and difference. And what I find most dynamic, actually, in that is 
it's not focused just on clergy. It's focused on anyone who wants to come to this wisdom tradition. We're going to give you the tools, and then you can go and spark new conversations and spread that technology around. It's incredibly inspiring. And the word technology, I'm going to take literally for a minute. Um, we have all evolved, especially during and post-pandemic, uh, in getting very comfortable with technology. But some are still allergic to it. Some feel like it kind of uh, in some way detracts or even disturbs a sense of spirituality. Um, you both, neither of you seem very afraid of it. And I would just love, let's start with you, Ben. Just where is technology actually a crucial tool right now? I think that we have seen, and I think this was really amplified, of course, because of COVID, we have seen the way in which loneliness is actually the greatest plague of our time, and that technology actually can be a part of an antidote to that. However, we are also seeing as we move into a new phase of COVID realities that it's not sufficient. And so actually I think many people, many colleagues of ours are finding that technology is a helpful way of opening the door of exposure, of having people see that, oh, there are others interested in the same thing, there are others actually asking the same questions, there are others looking for belonging and seeking as well. But then we have to figure out how do we open a door that actually invites them in to see the tangible nature of human relationship, of what it is to hear another voice singing beside us, to look across the table into another person's eyes, and to feel the way in which we actually impact each other. And so I, I think that as we look at technology, we see that this is going to be a definitional tool. And it also puts onus on us to think about in the in-person experiences, how do we leverage that in a way that fosters something that cannot be replicated online? And that's a question that we never really had to ask before. I'd like to add to that, yeah. if I may. People care more about excellence than they do geography. It used to be that a synagogue needed to be mediocre in a bunch of areas and close to your home. Now it doesn't need to actually engage in many areas. It needs to be outstanding in one or two or three areas that enough people care about. So when I think of East End Temple, I think its worship services are inspiring. I think we walk the walk in social justice. And I think we learn deeply in a way that is accessible to all. If that's all we're about, Dainu. And it used to be that we would also have to have a million different committees and a million different groups now we're talking about excellence, and we have congregants in Germany. We have congregants joining us from the West Coast. We have congregants all over because they resonate to what we do. So it is a challenge and an opportunity to use technology. And our tradition, it really is not in line with the Luddite tradition. We are people who have engaged with the printing press when it came out. And as a result, we had the Shulchan Aruch, that great legal code uh, promulgated all over Europe. Um, same with prayer books. Uh, a lot of the Hasidic style prayers that we have originated in the Holy Land uh, during and after the Spanish Inquisition because that's where great thinkers were and finally came to Europe once again by way of printing presses in Warsaw and in Italy. How amazing is that? We know that we can embrace technology so long as the underlying purpose is holy. And I think that's true across the board. We need to be engaged in excellence, we need to be mission focused, and we need to have a higher purpose. And when those are in place, technology is a tool that can advance all three. I know that you mentioned my synagogue, Central Synagogue, in your book, and the tens of thousands that actually live stream the high holiday services, and there is something powerful about knowing that whether someone is, frankly, in Korea or in Las Vegas, that they're essentially in the same room. Um, I, I want to ask you both about something that I think we don't talk honestly enough about, which is boredom in the Jewish world. Yes. And, and that sometimes, you know, these invested institutions, whether it's a synagogue or, you know, you name it, they're, they're, and I'm never bored at Central, I just want to be clear. <laughs> Understood. Um, <laughs> but those, those others out there, but there, there's just a reality. It's not just the impatience of technology, but, but we are used to kind of more of an in-demand. I watch something when I want to, and I, I channel surf when I'm bored, and I look at something that there is a sense, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit for the boring thing when I don't have to. And, and sometimes there's, there's a sense that I think our leaders are dug in. Like, if you're bored, so was I. <laughs> You know? Well, we, we have solutions in search of a problem, and that is the problem. Yes. Uh, in many ways, we need to surface the needs of people in our community and people who would never set foot in our communities and understand what's going on for them and how we can add value. 
And that would probably deal with a boredom. I mean, imagine if upon joining a synagogue, you sat down with leaders from the community and they said, tell us about yourself. What do you love? What are you worried about? What do you absolutely despise? And how can we add meaning to your life? I mean, wow, that's a different relationship altogether. And imagine if every Jewish institution was that focused on relationship and then using technology, using new means to deliver it in entirely new ways. Go ahead, Ben. I, you know, when we look back a century ago, what were the things that Jews needed? Um, very few of them had access to larger cultural centers. Very few of them could experience the opera or the theater. Many of them didn't have access to news of what was going on in the world. And so when you look Let at the- Let alone Netflix. Exactly right. <laughs> and so when we look at actually what was needed is in many ways Judaism moved into the education entertainment space because that was what was needed, is Jews wanted to feel like they had access to the, the best singing and erudite opportunities for speech and inspiration. And and so what, what happened actually is the rabbi and cantor roles grew to fill that need. When we look at today, the Jewish world doesn't need an entertainment center anymore. We have Netflix, uh, we've got Hulu, we've got Disney Plus, we've got lots and lots and lots of opportunities. Jews can go to the Met, Jews can go to you know, Broadway. And they don't need the hour long homily. No. And so I think looking at what are the trends happening in Jewish music, what are the trends happening in the way that people rabbi, is all starting to hear the needs of people and realizing maybe we need to move away from the entertainment industry and instead specialize in the engagement industry. How do we connect people together? Instead of trying to just fill the room with the flashiest program, maybe we need to figure out how can we connect people together to see that their loneliness can be met with belonging. I think COVID laid bare the fact that every synagogue is pretty much doing the exact same thing. And from an efficiency perspective in the American Jewish world, that may not be the best strategy moving forward. And so instead, what are we not doing? And what are other people doing better? And if we look at the fact that mm -hmm. Jewish pride is 94% across every demographic, okay, even the wayward younger generation, very proud of the Jewishness, but they don't need synagogue for that as much anymore. Mm -hmm. Professor Vanessa Oakes, you quote, describes the process of rethinking ritual this way. Quote, rather than blaming Jewish tradition for its being hard to penetrate or complaining that synagogues are boring and cold places, you can take responsibility for your own spiritual well, spiritual well being by shaping Jewish experiences that resonate with your world and your life. What does that mean? What would, um, let me start with you, Ben. So I think part of what Professor Oaks is lifting up is this recognition that Judaism has never been one static element. And so if we look at, for example, let's take prayer, for example. We can go back to the Bible and see that Hannah, the very first person that we really read having prayed, the high priest Eli had no idea what she was doing. I thought she was drunk. Exactly right. And I love that we get to read this over the high holidays because it's a nice reminder of humility, that we mm. are going to see people doing things Jewishly that does not feel Jewish to us. And lest we think that they are beyond the pale, we may want to just stop and listen a little bit longer because they may be onto something new. And if we go back 2,000 years, when people think about how they would observe and connect to God, it was through sacrifices in the temple. And uh, you know, Rabbi Brad Hirschfeld says this, and Rabbi Erwin Kula says this uh, to us all the time. Imagine a generation later, and they're going to a Passover Seder. And imagine what the priests would say, seeing Rabbi sitting around a table doing a Greek symposium party, and having a whole conversation and argument that would feel like it's an anathema. And so for, for some of what we're lifting up here is to say, before we're so quick to go and see these bizarre new traditions that are emerging from the margins to say, this is actually the frontier. This is what will become the new normal. Um, one of my favorite examples is dreidel. The great legends around dreidel, the top that we spin on Hanukkah, is that this was a distraction at the time of the Maccabees, so that um, the Assyrian Greek uh, soldiers... Wouldn't realize that they were actually doing Jewish ritual. Exactly. What most people don't realize, it actually, that wasn't the origin story. They were uh, gambling. It was a popular <laughs> gambling game from 300 years ago in, in Europe. And what I, I love about that is we can both then, like, roll our eyes and at the same time say that what Judaism has always done is it has said, how can we provide the tools to serve the needs of the people? But what about literacy? I mean, you can imagine the people are saying, all of this sounds very exciting. It sounds like people are going to connect and they're going to find themselves and they'll, you know, they'll have ritual, they'll have the holidays, but are they going to know Hebrew? Are they going to understand Talmud? Are they going to read a page of Talmud? 
Are they going to read the Torah through for, for a year and even know what those stories mean? Like, this is kind of the very flat-footed, are we going to lose Jewish literacy? Or maybe I'm, defi I'm defining it in a way that's very close-minded. Well, I love the question, what is Jewish literacy? And I think Torah now is Now you're going to be kind to me, but you can <laughs> stick it to me. You're saying I kind that. of like the, the question, what is Jewish literacy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I think that Torah might be more of a methodology than a fixed set of texts. And if Torah is a methodology of sussing out deeper ideas that even exist between the letters themselves, if it's a method of argumentation and wondering and asking questions that we can reply to and then ask more questions, I, I view Jewish literacy as a conversation across the millennia. And that is an open canon, not a closed canon. And so the problems in the way that we've currently engaged in Jewish literacy, or at least in many places, the methodology that conveys the most teaches the least about the process. And so I would love to see a process of inquiry that might not begin with a Talmudic text. I want to understand that, when you just said it teaches us least about the process, the process of inquiry, the process of debate. Yes, it, it is a very often in, in the communities, in the places, even in the Hebrew schools that convey the most content, it, it's done by rote. And the tragedy is you get the content without the feeling behind it. And we need an O oh, Captain, My Captain moment where a group gets together and they learn soulfully with their fullness of heart, even if they're not reading the Jewish equivalent of the Western canon. I'm not sure everyone knows oh, Captain, My Captain. Sorry, that was a terrible reference. <laughs> Let me, uh, they, they, we need to lead with our hearts. This is an era, um, Rabbi Larry Hoffman calls it a neo-romantic period. It is a period in which we are motivated and driven by our feelings. And we need to bring more heart to the study of Torah. We are so focused on benchmarks. It's almost like the era of standardized tests. How many books of the Torah have you read in the original and how many in the translation? How, many, how much of the Shas, how much of the Talmud have you read? Versus what are the texts that speak to you and what do they say? And can I ask you questions about how they talk to you? Because they might talk to me in a different way. But you're still you're not abandoning the text, am I right? Because Correct. all of this stuff about the heart can sound mushy to people. Yeah. Should they understand the Akedah? Should someone grow up and know that Abraham was going to sacrifice his son? Or are you saying like that isn't a tentpole? I'm saying that doesn't need to be the first tentpole that we raise. It, it is very helpful to know key Jewish stories. But if we feel comfortable going and studying, there are very few Jewish institutions today that can teach the entirety of Jewish literature, Jewish wisdom, the Torah. In fact, I would submit to you that that is a near impossibility, irrespective of whether you are studying 18 hours a day in yeshiva or you're going to one day a week religious school. But what we can convey is a love of text and the skills by which you need to engage with them individually and the inspiration to bring other people together to engage with them as well. So I think Jewish literacy as a static goal is gone, or perhaps should be gone. But Jewish literacy as a dynamic, as a relationship, as a way of bringing people together, as a way of unearthing wisdom that we need, that is driven by our needs at this moment, that is as alive as it's ever been. Ben, uh, you both, I don't know who authored what lines, we need to know what Jews value and who else values Judaism. How are Jewish ideas and practices permeating wider society? Can you expand a bit on that? Absolutely, and first I will say, every word of this book was touched by both of us, which is also its own um, process that reflects some of what we're lifting up here, is wisdom is never found alone in a room. It happens in the dyna dynamism of relationship. And you know, when we think about the, the needs and the Jewish values that we're going to see emerging here, what we're noticing is that often the organized Jewish world is lifting up data to try to see how do people match up against our definition of Jewish and what we are looking to see as a measure of success, rather than starting with a question, what do you like to do? What are you spending your free time on? What are the pains in your life? What are you struggling with? What gets you up in the morning? Mm. And when we start to ask those questions, it leads us to then ask, so with those pains, what's fulfilling those needs? Instead of saying, so how are we doing? Do you love the service? Do you like the melody? What that's suggesting is this is what's right and we're looking for the feedback of a thumbs up or thumbs down. When we do the much more difficult work of saying, what are you living out? 
what is the experience of your life? And to see that the purpose of Judaism has always been to be there to meet the needs of the people, that's where we really see the exciting frontier. Mm. For us, I think it begins with listening. As Josh said, you know, we are not the most um, exciting visual representation of Judaism. This is not a knock on appearance, but to say we have two white men in positions of power, this is typical, what you would expect of an American Jewish tradition. But what we've learned is actually the most important that we can do sometimes is to the opposite of what I'm doing right now, to stop, to listen, to ask the question, what do you need? and to wonder what might I be able to do not to solve that need, but to lift up the tools so that need can be met. Josh, you say uh, we hear a societal cry for connection and wellness. Where are you hearing that? Well, in the booming wellness industry, how many products are being sold at record profits right now? I think I'm buying a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Truth be told, I think I might be buying some of them too. But they're giving us the sense of well-being. They're giving us an imprimatur. And at the same time, they are profit maximizers. And they are not drawing necessarily from ancient wisdom. They are utilizing new technology in a way that gives people the jollies rather than fulfillment. And so the loneliness and the lack of wellness, I think, comes because we look at all these shiny objects before us on the internet, look at all of these things that we can purchase so easily rather than digging deep and doing the difficult work that Judaism encourages us to do, the work within and the work of building community. And if this is about co-creation, it's not something we can do ourselves, it's not something we can buy, and it's certainly not something, even as clergy, that we can reasonably sell. So Ben, what's at stake? And what do you want this book to do? Like, how do you want it to be used? How do you want it to be read? And let's kind of raise the stakes of why it matters. So we have full confidence that people's needs will always inevitably result in them creating the solution. So we actually have full optimism for the future of American Judaism, and it's already emerging around us. What we're hoping actually is that this book is an opportunity to do two things. One is to speak to the people right now who are on the margins, who are feeling like organizations that we're a part of or the American Jewish world is ignoring them to say, Listen, your voice actually, the things that you're feeling right now, that actually for us is the most important place to sit in and listen to. The other thing that we're trying to do is to speak to those of like us that are in the organized Jewish world to say there is a time of transformation underway right now. And if we only decide to retreat and bat down the hatches, we're going to find ourselves actually in a place where the world, American Jewish world has left us behind. We, tell, we lift up a story from the Talmud that is a real inspiration for us, where a group of rabbis that were living in the diaspora in Babylonia, they travel to go and see the ruins of the temple. And they see in the ruins that actually a fox has made a den uh, within the stones. And the rabbis start to wail, the center of Judaism, the thing that was the holiest place where the Ark of the Covenant once stood, where God would supposedly rest, now a fox is living there. And they weep and they cry. And Rabbi Akiva starts to laugh. And they ask, how could you possibly laugh? Look at the ruins. Look at what has been destroyed. Look at what we are losing. And he says, but if we listen to the prophets, we knew that these stones were going to come down. And yes, we should listen to the, chance to, uh, to the feelings of grief that come naturally from that sense of transformation. But also, we now have the gift and the opportunity to build what comes next. And I think that's really the core of what this book is about, is we have so much to celebrate of what has been accomplished already in the generations of American Jews, and we should do that. And in all the pain of the changes today also lies the opening of what is so exciting, is we are going to see a very new and different American Judaism, and it's one that we're hoping to invite people into rather than be opposed to. Josh, do you want to add to that at all? I think we try to live out some of the values that we encourage, which is that we can't do this alone. We need to acknowledge with humility all that we don't understand. And the status quo is untenable. If any other industry were engaging 30% of the possible market, they would see themselves as failures. And we are so afraid that if our institutions go under, American Judaism will go under, that we have gotten in a place of stuckness. And what we need to do is take a deep breath, acknowledge the loss, and then figure out all of the upside potential. If only we move beyond bricks and mortar, and I, if you'll pardon the pun, I 
think the Jewish future might be found in, certainly in central, and also in decentralization, and being okay that the bricks and mortar places are not the heart of our community, and that the people who once had power might have to share it far better than they ever have. I want to give you each a final word on what you think the resistance is or will be to the reality you are describing and to what you both feel is necessary. I want to start with you, Josh. Like, what do you think you, without naming names, what's going to stand in the way of this awakening? People who look like us and sound like us and inhabit roles like ours. In some ways, in addition to all of the other audiences for the book, this was intended as a conversation starter for rabbis. What are we doing and what are we not doing? Why are we so afraid to talk about what is not working? Why are we caught in a spiral of materialism in which on the sidelines of major conferences, rabbis talk about compensation packages and how fast their synagogues are growing, not how well people are served. And so if we can change minds of key leaders and we can start listening to the rising leaders all around us, then the success of the Jewish community is ahead. And I would just say, I think in my own life, in the lives of most people around me, in the times of change, we often want to draw in. At a time of turmoil, we try to make our world a little smaller so we can feel a little bit of a sense of control. And that is, I think, with love and compassion, what I see in myself and many others in the organized American Jewish world, there's a lot of change going on right now. It's a scary time. For those of us trying to balance budgets, for those of us trying to imagine how to keep jobs and how to put food on the table, it can be very challenging. But if we could take that deep breath, and if we could pull back, we actually have the benefit of drawing on a multi-millennial tradition that says to us, this has happened before. And so I think the obsession with authenticity is one of the great barriers, because mm -hmm. that has never been a successful obsession in Judaism. And when we look at the admixtures of today, when we see that probably one in seven, one in eight American Jews are Jews of color. We start to see that when we often talk about Jewish, we talk about people that look like us and talk like us. That's not actually the real story of American Judaism. And if we could let go of that, those of us who are at the center of organized Jewish communities, we could let go of the obsession over these are the check marks and the gold star you need to really be Jewish. We start to see that we now have somehow elevated Judaism as a world wisdom. People associate Judaism with a place of authenticity. People associate Judaism with, again, that wellspring of wisdom they want to draw from. And when we think about all of the religions of America, who could have thought a century ago that we would be the most well-liked tradition? Who could have imagined that four Jews would have run for president to the last election? Mm -hmm. We have so much to celebrate, and so amidst the fear, if we could let go of that obsession, we might just see that there's an awakening right in front of us. Rabbi Spratt, Rabbi Stanton, Josh, Ben, thank you. Thank you for this book. Thank you for your optimism. And if I riff on the title, thank you for waking us up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby. It's, it's been gift. a pleasure to be with you all again. Thank you for joining us for In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin, and I'll see you next time. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.